Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Dars highlights from December 25th, 2019 in Paris. The Sheikh tells us that we meet in this evening and may it be an opening for you and for us. We're not here to give a lesson or a dars like the jurists. Rather, we're here for mudakara, for reminding each other. And whoever has a question, they can ask. And if we happen to have an answer, we will try to respond to the best of our ability. Then one of the murids asks the Sheikh a question about a dream. And the Sheikh said, don't ask about a dream. Veridical dreams, pious dreams, come from God. And in reality, we are all sleeping. All we do is dream to life. When you ask a question in these kinds of contexts, ask a question that is in your heart, that stays in your heart for a long time and that motivates your thoughts and that you've been thinking about for a while. Ask a question that keeps coming back into your mind. This is the kind of question you should ask. Then one of the brothers asks about the invocation of blessings upon the Prophet nabi The Shaykh responded by saying that when you hear the word Salat, invocation of blessings upon the Prophet it actually has to do with Sila or a link, a connection, a connection between two people. And the gathering of, of two people, or the connection between two people, is what constitutes a jama'ah, an assembly, or a congregation. You're no longer alone in solitude when, let's say, you ask a question and you receive a response from someone, or when there is a dynamic between two parties, two individuals. Invoking blessings upon the Holy Prophet ﷺ, it's a sila, it's a invocation of blessings in congregation, in jama'ah. Because in the Qur'an, the verse states, Verily God and His angels invoke their blessings upon the Prophet. This is a gathering, an assembly. It's a congregation, in other words, God, Allah, with all of His names, all of His beautiful names, even His names that are not known. God and all of His names and attributes are present along with His angelic hosts, His entire angelic realm, in invoking blessings upon the Prophet ﷺ. And this prayer or invocation of blessings is eternal. It has no beginning. And the one who invokes blessings upon him has access to or partakes in this great assembly, this great congregation. The one who does not invoke blessings upon the Holy Prophet ﷺ is deprived of this eternal or beginningless prayer. In contrast, the one who invokes blessing upon the Prophet ﷺ partakes in this invocation or this connection, this sila which has no beginning and no end. When God says, in Allah wa malaikatahu, it means that He is present in His essence, the entirety of His names and His angels, and they invoke blessings upon the best of creation, alayhi salatu salam. And the command to invoke blessings upon Him, alayhi salatu salam, is directed to the believer, al-mu'min, ya ayyuhal amanu, O you who believe. This is not an invocation of blessings or an invitation to an invocation for the common submitter, for the Muslim. It's for the mu'min, the believer. Had Allah said, O mankind, or O submitters, O Muslims, invoke blessings upon him, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. All of mankind, you, you'd see all of Muslims in a state of ecstasy and madness out on the streets. But the verse in question addresses the station of the believer, al-Iman. Who are these believers? From the perspective of the innate human disposition, when you ask someone about faith, they point to their heart. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he wished to describe faith, he said, It is a light that God casts into the heart of his pious servant. It goes up and down or increases and decreases with pious acts, pious deeds. And in another hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, if you see your brother walk into the mosque five times a day, or if you see him praying five times a day, testify to his faith. 
bear witness that he is a believer. This is all with respect to the exterior. As for the interior, the non-manifest, God knows. Only God knows the reality of faith, of Iman. As for those who refuse to invoke blessings upon the Prophet والسلام, let's say when he's invoked in a dhikr circle, these are just testifying to their lack of faith, the lack of faith in their hearts. Of a heart full of faith, it suffices for that heart to hear or be exposed to the name of the Prophet والسلام, for them to invoke blessings upon him. Or as the hadith puts it, only the bakhil or the stingy one refuses to send blessings upon the Prophet ﷺ when his name is mentioned. God is with us in every moment and in every place, but we are not with him in every moment and every place because we're absent from his presence. We're only present with God in the heart of the prayer. Which means that in reality we only connect to our Lord through these encumbering or heavy acts of worship that are imposed upon us. In contrast, He is with us through His essence, attributes and names at all time and place. In this context, God says we shall show them our signs in the heavens and in themselves. Do they not see? When you invoke blessings upon the Prophet ﷺ, you find yourself in the assembly of the angels. Your very breath becomes the breath of the Prophet ﷺ because at that moment you extinguish yourself in his custom and his sunnah. This then is the true invocation of blessings upon the Prophet. Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, O you who believe, invoke your blessings upon him. And the Shaykh insists on or emphasizes the word sallu in the plural. It's a command, an imperative in the plural. Not salli, but sallu. This here is a response to those who consider group dhikr to be forbidden. Sallu alayhi, O you who believe, invoke your blessings upon him, send blessings upon him. This implies the congregation, the group, the assembly of blessings upon him, the assembly of those who come together to bless him. The station of Islam of submission is summarized by the hadith, pray as you see me pray. Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Whereas the station of Iman, of faith, is encapsulated by this prayer. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, O you who believe, sallu alayhi wa salimu taslima. Send your blessings of invocation, or send, invoke your blessings upon him. And send your greetings or salutations of peace. In a congregation, in a group, we don't send our blessings upon him just to relieve our own worries and our problems. The way some do. Who would say send X number of blessings upon him and you'll have less anxiety and so on. In reality, Salat al-Nabi is a love, it's a passion, it's a breath because your breath becomes his breath. And there are many verses that point to this. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ A messenger has come to you from among your own or from among within your breaths, from your own nafs, from your own soul. This is a Invocation with no beginning and no end because the one who sends salat upon the Prophet ﷺ has no beginning and no end. That's Allah Ta'ala. But we are weak and we only send our invocations of our, our blessings upon Him when we're asked. And moreover, we only do it in truth for the reward. And in this sense, there are many hadith which insist on the importance of sending blessings upon the Prophet ﷺ in return for rewards. Send a thousand blessings in return for this, and one blessing in return for that. Or the one who invokes blessings upon the Prophet ﷺ ten times in the morning, ten times in the evening, will obtain the prophetic intercession on Judgment Day. And in truth, due to our lack of love, we're only content with this kind of transactional relationship. As for the prayer of the people of God, theirs is permanent because they know that everything that was created was created through the light of the Prophet ﷺ. They know that his light is the first creation. How can one not send invocations and blessings upon him? And it is through this Salat ala nabi that one attains the Salawat or the blessings of the congregation, of the assembly. 
And the Prophet ﷺ says, don't send blessings upon me in a sterile way or the an invocation of those who are sterile. And here we have a an allusion to the importance of including the Ahlul Bayt, the family of the Prophet, the descendants, in one's prayer. Hence the formulation of the Salatul Ibrahimiyyah. Because during his time, people would make fun of the Prophet ﷺ for only having girls and for not having any surviving male descendants, children. And in this regard, God responds to those who mock the Prophet ﷺ with Surah Al-Kawthar. Verily we have given you the spring of abundance, Al-Kawthar. And he gives him descent, a lineage, a genealogy, which lasts to the end of time. And today no one can compare their genealogy, their descent to the Ahlul Bayt, the Prophet ﷺ's household. You can speak to a scholar who is professionally trained and you ask them about their family descent. If they're not from Ahlul Bayt, they can count perhaps up to five generations. As for a shepherd who's illiterate from the Ahlul Bayt, he knows nothing, but he can trace his lineage for dozens and dozens of generations all the way up to the Prophet ﷺ. He may know his genealogy perfectly all the way up to the Prophet ﷺ. The lineage of the Ahlul Bayt is known and lasts across time. This is an effect or it's through the invocations of blessings of God upon the Prophet ﷺ. It's through the Salat al Nabi and it's through the purification that God bestows upon the Ahlul Bayt. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا God only desires to remove defilement from you, O people of the house, and to purify you completely. We could spend our whole life talking about the prayer upon the Prophet ﷺ without even grasping an ounce of its worth. When the Prophet ﷺ asks his Lord, How did you create me? He responds, Bil Ba'na, here is not a verbatim hadith being cited, but just the meaning that God beheld his light and divided it into three, and from that division I created you and your descendants. It's a transcendent prayer for God and the angels is eternal. As for those who are extinguished in love of the Prophet, ﷺ, the people of direct witnessing, theirs is the love of the jama'ah, of the assembly, which is the hardest love. It's easy to love a unique or singular individual, but how can one love all Muslims at the same time? The love of the Prophet ﷺ in reality teaches us the love of the jama'ah, of the assembly. Love of the jama'ah teaches you to love your brother like your own mirror. In the sense where the Prophet ﷺ says, none of you is a believer until they love for their brother what they love for themselves. And the brother is the mirror of the believing brother. Love of the assembly or of the gathering of the jama'ah is to see your brother as your mirror in contrast to love of an individual which is in our innate disposition, in our fitrah. You love so-and-so because they were good to you. You love your wife because of this and that. But the more your heart is attached to loving the jama'ah, the more you draw near to loving the Prophet ﷺ. In this sense, God says, neither the heavens nor the earth can contain me except for the heart of the believer. This love is a cure to healing and an intercession for believers. That love is not only an intercession for the Muslims, it's for the others as well. The intercession of the Prophet ﷺ is destined to the grave sinners of his community. Those who commit grave sins may even be chased away by their family. But the Prophet ﷺ, he continues to love him. Is there a loved one comparable to the Prophet ﷺ? His love for us precedes our love for him. In this sense, Umar who goes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, O oh, Messenger of God, I love you. Then the Prophet ﷺ teaches him a lesson. And he teaches it to him and it's for us as well. He doesn't respond the way we do. He doesn't say, and I love you as well the way we do it out of convenience and out of adab. Rather, the Prophet ﷺ says, you won't love me, you will not truly love me until I become more precious, more beloved for you than your wealth, your children, and your own self. Three pillars, and no one can claim love of the Messenger ﷺ without fulfilling 
or honoring these three pillars, these three conditions. The first being that love for him والسلام, is more precious than your own wealth. That you'd be ready out of love for the Prophet وسلم, to renounce all of your belongings, followed by your children. And children are the thing that is most precious to us in this world. If someone comes to you and tells you that so-and-so is better than you, you could take it the wrong way, you could be offended. But if someone comes to you and you're a father, and only fathers know this, and someone tells you your son is better than you, then you would be happy, you would be in a state of joy. This is the proof that your child is the apple of your eye. And each of us love our children for different reasons. Some want to transmit their last name, their family names, through the child. Others want to transmit a heritage. Others want security in old age. There's always a desire there, and that is stripped by the love of the Prophet والسلام, which means if you have love for him والسلام, then you're ready to sacrifice this child for the sake of that love. And when you accomplish these two conditions, these prerequisites, there still remains one. You're not even a believer yet. You should know that you're not yet a believer. Because the third pillar comes. Your own selfhood, yourself. That the Prophet ﷺ becomes more precious to you than your own self. You're ready to sacrifice your whole life for him and for his descendants, Ahlul Bayt. If you accomplish that, then you're a true believer. And this is difficult for the one whose nafs, whose lower self, has blocked or stopped their wayfaring, has caused them a blockage in their suluk. Invoking blessings upon the Prophet is a gratuitous favor. It's a hiba, it's a blessing, a ni'mah. True love is a breath, it's a nafas. When a mother loves her child, even after the child does a great sin, and after the father kicks that child out, the mother still has unconditional love for their child. She does everything to keep the child close to her. This is the nafas, this, the breath that we're talking about. The Prophet ﷺ accepts the sins of the believers, and he continues to love them. He accepts them as they are. He accepts them, and we continue to love just ourselves. And despite this love, unconditional love that he ﷺ gives us, we continue to engage transactionally as merchants with our remembrance, with our dhikr. Which means that we do all this dhikr, all these meditations and remembrances and prayers in return for a certain recompense or a reward. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad kama sallayta ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala ali Sayyidina Ibrahim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad kama barakta ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala ali Sayyidina Ibrahim في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد